Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Assistive Technology Tools for Transition and Beyond, presented by Therese Wilcom. My name is Beth Schaffner, and I am the director of the RSA Shift Transition Project at Peak Parent Center. Um, our project is a five-year um, grant from the Rehabilitation Services Administration in Washington um, to provide information and training um, regarding transition, including self-advocacy, the role of families, and accessing supports and services for youth, parents, and others. So again, welcome to the webinar. And um, I want to now uh, introduce Therese Wilcom. Therese is with the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability. Um, Dr. Wilcom is currently the director of the New Hampshire Statewide Assistive Technology Program. And she is a longtime colleague and ally of Peak Parent Center and an ally for youth and families of youth with disabilities. So welcome, Therese. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to you so that you can begin. All right. Thank you, everybody. OK, well, good afternoon. Um, I am really excited about doing this, this webinar on assistive technology and, and transition and, and tools. And I first wanted to just share some of the handouts before I jump into the PowerPoint presentation that shows you a variety of different assistive technology solutions. This is one of the screening tools that I use when I'm doing various um, assistive technology transition um, assessments. So here's a screening tool that I use for students transitioning from high school to post-secondary education. And I'm just going to exit out of this for a second. There we go. OK. Um, and after we complete the transition screening tool here, um, I wanted to show you that we then begin planning. And so assistive technology has a really high failure rate. So when we identify particular needs that could benefit from an assistive technology solution, we then look at different devices or demonstrations, trial loans um, to try out the equipment. Ideally, we want to do this when the student is in high school so that by the time they get to college, they can hit the street running. Or by the time they go into employment, they've already had exposure to the technology. We've done some situational assessments with the technology. So, Here's the worksheet that we use when we're planning for device loans, demos, trials. But we also do a lot of um, looking at the issue regarding maintenance and repair. Because if somebody does identify a particular device that is going to work and that device they become very proficient with, you need to track the make and model. You need to track what's going to happen if that device breaks down. Uh, who are you going to call? And so that's what this particular worksheet is about. So who's responsible? And then the last worksheet here on this handout is for device fabrication, modification, or installation. So if it's an electronic aid for daily living, um, or if it's a, an iPad adaptation, or maybe it's a modification in the workplace, we need to really clearly define what it is um, who's going to do it, when, what's the contact information. And so we have everybody agrees to what's going to happen when so that the transition process can be as smooth as possible. This next handout is another screening tool. And this is what I use when I'm looking at somebody transitioning from school to work. And I want to find out 
what are the particular tasks? So usually we find out we work with vocational rehabilitation um, after the particular vocational goal is identified or the job is identified. We want to know which of the tasks that the person might have problems with completing. And so we want to do a mismatch analysis. So first of all, we want to know as much as possible about the student. And so we check off what are the physical, sensory, cognitive limitations. And we also check off which are the physical, sensory, cognitive abilities required to perform that particular task. And then what we do is we highlight anywhere that there's a double hit. Wherever there's a double hit, we then dive more into more details about the nature of those limitations and the nature of the abilities that are required to do that particular task. And then we develop our assistive technology plan from there to create the accommodations, modifications, um, implementation of the assistive technology devices. So next, I'm going to go to this PowerPoint presentation. And we're going to quickly go through a variety of different um, assistive technology examples. And a lot of this is going to start off with employment related, but we'll also talk about community living and about post-secondary ed and tools that can be used in an educational environment. So when we look at just different career paths that we've worked with students in transition in, um, the first area has been in agriculture. And in agriculture, something as simple as wind chimes for somebody with a vision impairment and each wind chime having different tones for navigating and orientation and mobility around an agricultural work setting. Um, even radio stations set at um, putting radios in the machine shed or the milk house and set them at two different stations can be really a low cost way of orientating yourself around the farm if you happen to have a vision impairment. Um, livestock handling, um, holding devices. Um, this one is adapting some of the different hoses. Um, this worker had a hard time gripping onto the hose, so we adapted um, a glove to help him grip onto the hose. Lawn care has been a really popular um, occupation. It's been a popular, um, in high school, a lot of people get jobs mowing grass. And this is an example of um, this gentleman got a full-time job after graduating from high school doing lawn care and doing um, commercial lawn care, but he had to get his riding lawnmower to and from different places. He had to have a specialized ramp and a trailer that um, the mower can go up onto. And you'll see this motor is all hand controlled. And many of these motors or many of these mowers are now hand controlled. And so this makes a really great um, worksite accommodation for anyone who experiences a spinal cord injury. So here he is rolling up and he pushes the button to raise the ramp up and down. He unloads his, his mower. So he's able to be completely independent. Um, this was set up as a part-time job, um, blowing leaves and mounting a leaf blower. Um, this gentleman is using his chin to move the uh, joystick on his wheelchair. And this is a Black & Decker cordless leaf blower. Um, there's a variety of different back saving tools, um, greenhouse work, uh, various gardening work, and um, just these are really nice labor saving tools that benefit everyone. Um, they're lightweight, easy to maneuver around. There's a lot of different forearm grips and we can also make adapted gardening tools as well for individuals who may be perhaps gardening from a wheelchair or using a walker and trying to garden. Onto an additional shovel, ergonomic grips. Um, in this particular job, this was a greenhouse job, and this is a, a high school student transitioning to doing some greenhouse work. 
Well, her job was to fill these pots with dirt and she only had a sweeping movement. And so we created a specialized tray that the dirt drops onto and she sweeps and slides the dirt into the um, pot below, but then made a little track that all the pots line up and slide over. And so that she, as soon as she gets that one filled, it can go on to the next person to put the seeds in. So that's just a basic, and this is just made out of, out of acrylic and acrylic has a very low melting temperature is a very simple way to adapt and create um, a tray on the fly. All right, office work is another um, occupation and, and we see office work being done also in home-based enterprises. And there's this whole big gig economy now where people are doing a variety of jobs out of their home. And in this particular job, we had to create a lazy Susan to be able to rotate these um, insurance booklets around. And for 50 cents, I was able to get a lazy Susan bearing. And then at Walmart, they have these um, elevating tables that go from 18 inches all the way up to 29 inches. And so it's a nice, really fast, low cost way of making a worksite adaptation in somebody's home environment. Um, ways of having creating sit stand workstations for doing computer access. In some environments where someone does not have the use of their hands, we look at using material called lock line where we can position an iPad, we can position um, a cup holder, anything that the worker needs in front of them using lock line because it's easily removable, positionable. Um, this is, we call it the virtual personal care assistant. This is a, a worker that needed to be able to eat independently at his workstation. And so this is using lock line and it's in the iPad. Um, creating scan and read stations. So for vision impairments or learning disabilities, there's now a number of new apps that are available that will quickly scan the document and read it out loud. These can be made in under a minute. Um, this is a particular job where the um, worker had to, um, she had to be able to take calls, transfer calls. And in high school, her challenge was numbers and reading. And so we took pictures of everybody in this particular office and put their picture next to the speed dial button. And then the hold button we put into a stop sign button and the transfer button into a go button. And she's been quite successful in this particular office. Um, using colors for worksite accommodations. I've used colors for a lot of different things. One is for photocopying and knowing how many copies and which copies go to the green office. And these little post-it notes work really great because you can stick them in the upper right hand corner, put the number of copies that need to be made, and then the worker just peels the sticky off, sticks it on the copy machine while they're making the copies, then they stick the little sticky back on and, and off they go. Um, even feeding horses, I found that if I color coded the different barrels and then put pictures above each horse of the different like two green, one red, one blue, it not only helped the high school student that was um, experiencing an intellectual disability, but the employer said it helped all the workers and it increased productivity of all the workers, just simplifying the tasks and using colors and color coding. So in production, sometimes people have a hard time holding on to, um, these are different connectors that are in, used in the electrical industry. And so creating or providing a particular clamp to make it easier to grip onto because the person couldn't hold these with their hands or changing the angle that different parts are grabbed out of. So this is just taking a shop rag and some pipe insulation and a piece of wood and just cutting a little groove that this drops into. Um, this particular job was the, the workers had to cut string and the string all had to be cut for the packaging and this worker couldn't cut the string. So I just took a regular pair of scissors and took some Instamorph and also um, a clothespin and created a spring loaded scissors and a jig that the, 
the string can slide into can, and can be easily cut. Now, this particular job, multi-sensory assembly of med kits, and the employees experienced intellectual disabilities and they had to do assembly. And there were so many errors and they had to assemble these med kits. And I found that if I just chunked it down into sequences of three, um, that the workers were able to succeed. And then the little black things are, I would record a message that would say, put the plastic tube in the aluminum tube and then screw the cap on. So you had the actual product there, you had a, had a picture of somebody screwing it in. So you had auditory, visual and tactile. And also changing the colors of the little hand sheets. So, at, so when you have orange, white and green, you can quickly see if you're missing one of the papers that you're sliding in. Um, also doing a task analysis and thinking about, can I eliminate the cognitive demands associated with a particular task? So this is a, a sorting task where they're sorting colored paper from um, white paper and um, having somebody just focus on color and having somebody just focus on white to increase productivity. So just chunking it down, um, we do time and motion studies on how long does it take that person to do the task without using assistive technology. And then we try a lot of different approaches and we do time and motion studies to see does their speed increase and does error rate decrease. Sometimes some of the jobs are, they're working side by side with a job coach um, or coworkers. And so this gentleman only has the use of one hand and he's also blind and the job requires putting labels on these boxes. So using PVC and pink board, creating a particular jig that he can slide up and then to be able to put labels on. Um, this worker had got a job at a restaurant and had to roll up silverware with one hand and also had a visual impairment. And again, this is just pink board that you can find at Home Depot and very easy. The napkin goes down, the silverware goes in, and as soon as you push down, the corners lift up and it's very easy to fold over and roll up. Contrasting colors also work great for visual and cognitive demands. This is a job you had to count a number of forks to put in the box. And so just taking model magic that you find at Michael's and making a specialized jig. Um, this is in the post office and rubber bands had to be put around people's mail. But how are we going to do that if you only had the use of one hand? So just using discarded election signs and creating a rubber band jig, the mail slides in and then you just snap the rubber band over it, slides out. Um, different scales for weighing stuff um, to make it easier so that you don't have to lift the particular object up and over onto a scale. Uh, rapid prototyping. And the workers were having a hard time uh, scooping out these different parts. And here was another example where we adapted this rake for this worker with a disability. And it turned out that the employer wanted all employees to use the adapted rakes. Uh, color coding with bins. Target has a lot of different color coded bins and it makes work tasks much easier um, if everything's organized by colors. Okay, maintenance and repair careers. There's a lot of new labor saving tools, uh, one handed hammers, um, hammers that have magnetic slots to hold a nail in place or these trolleys for moving heavy sheets of plywood or drywall. Or Black & Decker has a lot of really awesome um, cordless tools like an auto tape measure or an auto wrench that's battery operated. Again, these things benefit everyone, not just somebody with a disability. Um, a lot of times holding on to tools and there's a lot of different gripping solutions for tools. This is called the helpful hand. Here's a magnetic finger for holding on to um, tools. Then there's the rare earth magnets. I use these, these are really tiny, but really strong rare earth magnets. 
And whenever possible, if somebody needs help with gripping on or holding things or reaching things, um, I use JB Well with a rare earth magnet and I attach it to sticks, I attach it to a variety of things. Magnets can be really useful. Here's an example of someone having to strip wires and um, taking a wire stripper, turning it upside down and mounting it in place to make it easier for stripping wires. Uh, this was an employee that had um, cerebral palsy and had a very difficult time gripping onto things. And I was able to find this cam assisted pliers to help him. Um, here's another one. This is at the YMCA and this was a job cleaning the floors, but the worker was unable to grab a hold of the handle and push the mop. So I turned the mop into somewhat of a walker using Swiffer dusters that attach to the top of the mop. And the cool thing when you push this, the all three pivot points will, will pivot at the end of each row as it's being mopped. Um, this is a particular job in food service. So this high school student we were looking at, there was a, a place that was hiring that um, you had to make um, sandwiches and he had to put vinyl gloves on his hand. Well, he only had the use of one hand. So for $5, I found a quick grip clamp and I took Instamorph and wrapped it around the end of the quick grip clamp to create a little hook so he could put vinyl gloves on um, with one hand and take them off with one hand. Um, this is uh, an adaptation for how do you tie a knot in a garbage bag to take it out. Again, with Instamorph and corrugated plastic making a little um, clip that the bag holds into that it can be done with one hand. All right, food service. Um, how do you scrape things out of a bowl if you only have the use of one hand or have a hard time holding on to a bowl for scraping? And this is just using lock line and the bowl just drops into place. Makes it easy and to raise the bowl up like two inches above the cake pan. Um, carrying glove or carrying beverages uh, on a wheelchair, canes, walkers, crutches. This material is called Velcro brand one wrap and can very quickly carrying uh, a cup holder to transport your beverages. Um, hand washing. Um, here's an example of using quick grip clamps. But this is something even more significant because the iPad is in a Ziploc bag. And with it being in the Ziploc bag and being easily positioned at any workstation, you can do task sequencing. So let's say it's salad prep and somebody has to cut up tomatoes or carrots. They can quickly swipe through. You don't have to worry about the iPad getting wet or damaged because it's sealed in a Ziploc bag. Um, here's Morgan. He's a mechanical engineering student at the University of New Hampshire. And just getting around campus can often be a challenge or he got tired of people having to carry his beverages or his cup of coffee. And so just quickly making a cup holder for him so that he can go to class. And then also his canes. When he get into the classroom, people were tripping over his canes. So I use picnic table clamps that clamp onto the edge of the table to hold his case. Um, in the college environment and, and in other environments, one of the most common problems or challenges that many um, students and adults experience is executive function impairments and, and forgetting where they put their phone, forgetting where they put their keys um, and can't find things. And, and also, needing solutions for reminding. So reminding and finding. So first of all, let's talk a little bit on this particular picture, tile. Tile is probably my most favorite device for finding objects. So tile company is betting that everybody's gonna wanna buy tiles and put it on all their different devices so that they can uh, quickly find things that they've lost. There's stick and find, but I don't like stick and find as much as I do like uh, the tiles. The tiles are very loud and the tiles work both ways. So like, let's say um, you've lost your keys, but you um, have your phone and you, you can use your phone to alert one of the tiles for finding. 
Now, for prompting and reminding you to do tasks, epill.com has the most comprehensive site for, for hundreds of different reminding kinds of solutions. And this one, you set it for a different time. You can set it for every hour or the half hour to remind you of something, but you have to have a list next to it to let you know if you look at, okay, what's at 305, where am I supposed to be? So when that alarm goes off, you can quickly look at where you're supposed to be. Then there's motion sensors for prompts and alerts. And there's more and more different motion sensors that you can have a message play um, that'll tell you, hey, um, it's time to um, uh, get on the bus or whatever that might be, you can program in there. Tactile prompts. There's vibrating pagers, vibrating watch reminders, vibrating cell phones, and um, ePill has the majority of the vibrating prompts. And just want to talk about very quickly, there's Coronas and this little, there's a little disc that goes on the bottom of a watch and that can be set up with a smartphone to vibrate. But I don't like it very much because um, it's not a strong enough vibration. Both of these watches from ePill, I like these watches because they've got a really strong vibration uh, built right into them. Then the Apple Watch works really well for, for vibration, but the Apple Watch will send a text message. And this watch over here will send a text message as well. So you get um, auditory vibration, you can get a, also a beep, and then also tactile. Then you can do vibration mapping for different reminders for different tasks. So like, let's say you don't wanna look at your watch, but you know what the vibration pattern is to tell you where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to be doing. And so that works out really great for individuals who experience um, hearing impairments in a way um, doing vibration mapping. Um, also, vibration mapping can work well with individuals with vision impairments who are unable to read different text messages but can be taught a vibration pattern that means something. So here are my two favorite watches from ePill. You can put up to um, 12 reoccurring vibrating prompts, and they're much cheaper than having to go with uh, an Apple Watch, and you don't need to have a smartphone with either one of these. So there's wearable technologies. Um, there's the Pebbles Watch, which is now bought up by Fitbit. Um, this wearable technologies, Google Glass was the first one that came out with it, and Google Glass, um, they've discontinued, but we were at a show this past um, year, and there's more cameras being mounted onto glasses that are being used for reading different things in the workplace. Um, also GPS and scan and read stations. So there's tons of different apps and accessories to help with in post-secondary education, in the community, also in employment. iPads have been having a profound impact in the field of transition. And this is an example of somebody who only has use of one hand, who is using a communication app in the shoe department at JCPenney's. Therese, uh, this is Beth. Can I just interrupt for a minute? Um, sure. We've had We've had some questions about, and I was wondering if you, as you're going through some of these examples, um, I think many of them were are effective for individuals with a with a variety of disabilities. And we had a, some questions about um, supporting individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as those with physical disabilities. Yes, so that's why I was talking about intellectual disabilities for like using a photo album, um, using colors for intellectual disabilities, using um, prompts, vibrating prompts for intellectual disabilities, um, using um, sequencing, using apps for intellectual disabilities, um, mail sorting and intellectual disabilities, 
um, uh, assembly line with intellectual disabilities. Um, this one is um, iPads and apps for vision impairments. But this one at the bottom, which says seeing AI is what I use for intellectual disabilities because I do um, feature mapping. So when I do a cognitive demand analysis of assistive technology for an intellectual disability, I look at how many steps does somebody have to use to be able to use an app. And the seeing AI, um, I can train somebody just to hit the lower right hand icon in the start area on the smartphone. And what happens is with the seeing AI app is it immediately reads whatever is in front of them. And so that has worked out really well in an educational environment. The other part with um, intellectual disabilities, the Say and Go app, uh, least number of demands, Say and Go, you don't have to do any reading, you don't have to do any scrolling, you tap the app, you say like um, soccer practice or um, uh, pack my shoes or whatever that might be. And then in the background, it automatically pushes that auditory message to anybody's cell phone that you decide. So that has the least number of cognitive demands. Um, Adia is also great for intellectual disabilities because you can program all of these different reminders to go off in the person's voice to tell the person where they should be, what they should be doing. Um, photo albums work great um, with video clips with intellectual disabilities because the person can be independent in the workplace by um, flipping through the pictures or the video clips, the how-to video clips. So it requires only two taps to play that clip and each clip is maybe about five seconds and they can play it over and over until they have that task down before they go on to the next task. Uh, Patella is another great app for task sequencing. Um, Scene Speak, for, these are all for intellectual disabilities. Um, Coach M Video for video modeling, um, Priority Matrix. Um, I talked about the My Tile app for finding misplaced tools in the workplace. Um, this next one, Everyday Tools and Materials for Creating accommodations and and when I go out onto the job site and I'm working with somebody with an intellectual disability and I need to make something really fast and as I was explaining earlier with time and motion studies of really looking at and watching how they're interacting with the workplace and what do I have to do to make it faster or easier for them to do and I will make um, jigs and fixtures to reduce the cognitive demands. And these are the tools and materials that I use for making worksite adaptations on the fly. And these are the different adhesives that I would use. I use some different plastics that I use. And um, when I come to the peak conference, I'm going to be, you know, showing more examples. Um, positioning, even positioning an iPad um, in the workplace to make it easier. We have a gentleman with an intellectual disability uh, working at Home Depot um, as a greeter. And um, he's just greeting and positioning the iPad using the Eileen makes it easier for him to be a greeter at the door. Um, this is uh, using a mouse stick to be able to type independently on the phone. Um, here's using Instamorph as uh, adapting a key for somebody that has a hard time turning the key or adding a flashlight onto a cane, um, adding a, an additional handle onto a shovel. Um, this was used for someone um, with an intellectual disability who needed to quickly alert their supervisor if they needed more materials. And so this is just taking um, a $4 two-way radio and lining up the little button on the CD box with the call button on the radio. The person just pushes down, transmits up to two miles away to alert their supervisor if they need some assistance or more help. Um, sometimes just uh, like, how do you get pills out of blister packs? This is just a cherry pitter. 
Um, I look at everyday items, like all the different ways you can use a Swiffer duster, um, shark vacuum cleaner attachments, telescoping spoons, just for reaching. And so um, some of the resources I like is the Job Accommodation Network. Um, oh, I want to come back to, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the resource. Okay. Um, there's also the AT for employers. There's the agribility. Um, there's also all of the statewide assistive technology projects. And Colorado has um, a statewide um, AT program um, that does device loans, demonstrations, uh, device reutilization. And um, also financing activities. So I share a lot of different ideas in my book on solutions in minutes. Um, I want to come back. I want to show another resource that I put together. And these are, you know, 101 uses for the iPhone camera for employment for persons with disabilities. And many individuals we work with have intellectual disabilities. And so Therefore, how can we use some of these apps to help them to be more successful? I talked about a few of these um, in regards to organization. There's Can Plan for intellectual disabilities, um, iPrompt, Bug Me, Photo Notes. So here's just a variety that can be used. There's also um, um, different um, tools, so substitutes for um, some of the reading and writing, um, using pictures and video instead. Um, video modeling has been something that has been really quite powerful. And having access to an iPad has made video modeling um, a really great tool for individuals with intellectual disabilities to be independent. But it's important to note when you're doing video modeling, that you always put the iPhone or the iPad to the right um, side. If the person's right-handed, you put it next to their right eye as you're filming them doing a particular task so that you're always seeing those tasks through the eyes of the doer, the eyes of the performer. So the, the person's perspective is when they look at that clip, they're seeing their hands reaching out, cutting up a maybe doing salad prep, whatever that might be. And so um, the interesting thing is in the majority of support for students with intellectual disabilities transitioning from school to work, school to the community, they often have a job coach. And the job coach, um, we're trying to see, can we use assistive technology to wean the job coach away? And for some people, we've been successful. And for some people, they have developed a dependency of the job coach. And that, that's the, one of the real challenges is trying to create natural supports. Because if we take a job coach away and we replace it with assistive technology, um, the person often feels really isolated. And they may do fine with the AT for a few days, but then they end up missing their job coach. And so using virtual participation of having the job coach still available, whether it be Skype or Zoom or other um, video conferencing kinds of, of technologies or features. Okay. So um, I'm gonna open it up now if anybody has um, any questions. And Therese, this is Beth. I already responded to a question about uh, someone who really wanted your slides to, to uh, be able to have. And I let them know that the, there is a file, a, a document in the handouts. Um, it says slides, assistive tech, welcome 2017. That is the same slides you've been showing us. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So everybody should have a copy of my PowerPoint um, that has a list of all these different apps that are my favorite apps. Great.
And Pam, have you, um, Pam has been monitoring questions as well. Have you um, seen any, Pam, that, that have been coming up? And please feel free to type in your questions for Therese. No, I, I haven't seen any questions on my end. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I wanted to make sure that I had enough time for uh, any questions. And I know that I went through um, very, very quickly. Um, I, I think that, that um, the um, looking at this whole thing of feature mapping with technology and um, intellectual disabilities. I think that a lot of assistive technology is too complex and has um, too many cognitive demands. And so our goal is, is to really work with app developers to reduce the cognitive demands so that to have things that go auto. And one of the one of my biggest complaints that's going to change really uh, hopefully in October is, you know, when you're using um, uh, an iPhone, um, you know, what do you have to do? You have to you have to swipe the iPhone. Maybe you have to put a password in. And just yesterday, one of the big headlines is the change in the cameras. Um, cameras having infrared that will lock onto your facial feature, your eyes, etc. And so your phone will automatically open up as soon as the camera sees your face. So no longer needing to type, no longer needing to do this whole swiping thing. That is really going to benefit individuals with intellectual disabilities. And once that gets embedded into the um, iPad, that is going to be profound. The other thing that's going to happen in October is um, built into the new operating system on iPhones is the ability to do QR code scanning. And so imagine if you had an intellectual disability and the QR code is always at the right bottom of the scanner is you walk up to your job site, you know, you, you, you scan the QR code and voila, a video clip plays exactly what you need to do at that particular station. So that whole thing of the number of steps is um, getting less and less and less, and that's what we want it to be. And by reducing all of those steps, it makes it easier for everyone. And I didn't talk about Alexa. I think Alexa is a game changer as well. Um, Alexa in environments of being able to talk to Alexa, uh, the Alexa talks back and asks you questions back to clarify. Alexa works really great for reminding in um, like gig economies, home-based um, employment. Also using Alexa to turn on different lights or different appliances at certain times to turn things off. I think Alexa continues to get smarter and smarter and then the Alexa dot. I think that's a really profound uh, tool that people should be aware of also when you're thinking about transitioning from school to work, school to post-secondary ed, or school to uh, back to the community. Um, let's see. Thinking about what else I forgot to tell you about. Um, video modeling, Alexa, reminding devices, color coding, um, feature mapping. Um, you know, there could be just a whole webinar just really exploring the different apps themselves. And, you know, I wanted to say that there's a lot of transition tools that are out there. Um, and I wanted to focus on only transition tools related to the assistive technology piece. And assistive technology needs to be considered during transition planning and need to be thinking about how are you going to communicate and text or how are you going to use the phone and for one gentleman um, what we created was a way that he could answer the phone or he could call his mom using switch access recipes uh, with facetime on his cell phone and just um, just one switch that can do the automatic call or the automatic answer so this really works out quite nicely 
um, with um, the iPad and uh, switch interfaces. Therese, uh, this is Beth again. We have a couple of questions about your book. What is the name of your book? And can you tell us more about um, the resources that you have written and, and what folks can access? All right, so um, so this this book is about four years old, and it's uh, it's on so so it's available through Amazon, it's available through the IOD bookstore, and it's about creating solutions in minutes. If you only have five minutes to make a difference in somebody's life, what could you do? And it also has a DVD in it that has 115 how-to video clips on how to make the various projects. And um, all the pages in there have um, a variety of like, um, how do you make something with um, Lockline, if you've never used Lockline before, or PVC pipe. So it has a variety of different projects. And I'm also working on my new book, which is a QR code book to um, all of my how-to video clips. So if you're out in the field and you're like, geez, that looks like a really great idea, I want to be able to build that right now. And so you can take your phone and you can scan the QR code. And, and I was hoping this fall to have this book that goes out. Eventually, I want to turn it into um, an app so that you could put the keyword in there. You could put in um, food prep and intellectual disabilities, um, or you could put in adapted gardening tools and app pops, all the different ways you can adapt gardening tools and, and environments. So I'm really, really excited about uh, that particular project. I think that is gonna be really awesome because it'll be um, solution driven and quick access. Another thing I wanna share with you, and that is Book Creator. Uh, Book Creator is a game changer for um, transition and intellectual disabilities. So. I'll give you an example of, um, I did a switch access recipe um, for answering a phone, right? Well, it turns out that it's 38 steps that you have to go through with your iPad to create a switch access recipe that's um, to answer a phone or to operate YouTube. And um, so I did a video and it only takes four minutes to do it. I didn't think it was such a big deal and put it up on YouTube and ask my students to replicate it. Well, what's hard about that is you watch it and then you have to pause it or maybe you have to rewind it because you maybe f missed a step. With Book Creator, you can take 30, you can you have 38 five second little video clips that take you through each little step and having these mini clips that you just swipe through going, okay, yep, I did that step. Yep, I did that step. Yep, I did that step and just to quickly be flipping um, back and forth as, as you're, you're um, programming it. And so I think, uh, it, you know, they're also talking about Book Creator being a web-based, and that was supposed to happen this summer, perhaps this fall, so that it, it's available to everyone. And uh, there's Book Creator, people are putting things up for free. And I'd like to eventually get to having all these little mini books for the different projects to make it easier for people to, um, to use to make different adaptations. Thank you very much, Therese. This has been wonderful. Um, and we definitely appreciate you um, doing this for us today. Um, I have a couple of uh, things that I want to share with folks before we close, but I do want to remind you that, that Therese, you did have your contact information, I know, on one of your slides. And um, we also want to let you know that, that, um, that Therese is, as she mentioned, I think a little while ago, she's going to be a presenter at PEAK's annual inclusive education conference coming up in February, on February 8th and 9th. And 
We're very happy about that. And um, we did add a handout, kind of a save the date reminder to the handouts um, to help you to, to mark that date. So we hope you'll join us for that conference and be able to join Therese again. And um, questions that you have, you can also direct to, um, you can direct to to us at PEAK. Um, we're, we're switching over, Therese, to, um, to our slide about contacting PEAK for information. Um, PEAK's project has a lot of resources available for you and um, so we want you to be able to contact us. We have a transition advisor on staff. We also have webinars, um, including this webinar will eventually be closed captioned and placed on our website. Um, there are two more webinars coming up in this series um, on next Wednesday, August 23rd, Beth Gallagher, who is from San Diego, who is another great colleague and ally, is going to be uh, talking to us about person-centered transition planning. And then the following Wednesday on August 30th, we will be talking about all the various transitions, including transition from school and, be, to, and beyond uh, with our Peak Parent Center staff people um, and really focusing on starting the school off right. One of the other things I wanted to mention, um, Therese referred to um, our Colorado Assistive Technology Group. And um, if you would let us know, um, we can uh, connect you. I believe we may have one of those people on our, had one of those folks, uh, Maureen Malonis from Assistive Technology Partners, which is a part of the University of Colorado at Denver, um, who can be a resource to those of us here in Colorado in similar ways to how, um, Therese is a resource in New Hampshire, but Therese, we're so glad that you joined us today and you became a great resource to us. And we hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Therese. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.